Hey, 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 my Equalizer fans, it's your girl Barbie J here with Season 3, Episode 17, Justified. And honey, Robin thought she was justified with doing everything she was doing. And I ain't mad at her for it. And this was, I, I tell you, all these five-star uh, episodes is just... This, this show, if they ever cancel, I'm just going to lose my mind up in here, up in here. But I got to tell y'all, I am so, so sorry. I am so sorry for getting this out to you guys so late. But, you know, I had Mother's Day celebration over the weekend from Saturday and Sunday. Then Monday was the doctor's appointments. Then Tuesday was the all-day funeral for family, close family, friend. Then Wednesday, I had a concert, and I had to sing. I had a little solo in our choirs on concert. And then today, I got workers out there. They were tearing up my backyard. So I'm just like, I am overwhelmed. I am tired. I'm exhausted. But I wanted to get this out to you guys <laughs> before Friday. Lord, help me. Anyway, let's get started with this recap. But before we get started, if you have not subscribed to my channel, please take a moment right now and hit that subscribe button. Then hit the notification bell. It'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Then I ask that you like, comment, and share the video. Now, y'all know I was trying to reach a, a 2,000 subscribers by my birthday, but we only have like two weeks left. I don't know if I'll be able to make it, but hopefully we'll get close, okay? It's just that I've been overwhelmed with a lot of stuff that's going on, and I still can use your help, though. If you can share my video and get me to that reach that mile um that goal of mine of 2000 subscribers by June 1st I would love you to death well I love you anyway so let's get started anyway with this recap so I truly enjoyed this episode like I was saying because it gave us insight into Robin's you know past and, and why she's always blamed herself for her father's death which we learned was as Aunt Vi told her many times, it was not her fault at all, you know, and I'm glad that Robin and Vi were able to get some closure about the death of Robin's dad and Vi's brother. You know what I mean? I mean, oh my gosh, this episode was, it, let me just go on into it because I just was all over the place like, oh snap, oh snap, even how it ended with Detective Dante. That was, that was a trip. But anyway, so this episode starts off with Robin and Delilah and Aunt Vi eating at the Brass Spoon. Remember that episode when Vi helped the deceased owner's son revise his mother's old recipes and stuff to bring it back to that soul food or whatever they restaurant, I think it was. I believe it was in Manhattan. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody in the comment section. Anyway, when Dee and um, Vi step away, Robin see, um, sees an old friend, you know, what's his name, Marlon Dean or something, standing at the counter, and she goes over to speak with him, and he called her R. Breezy. I was like, what do R. Breezy stand for? And he claims that the last time he saw her, she was hot wiring a Lexus, oh, which just goes to show that, you know, back in the day, Robin did some illegal things, y'all. So Robin lets, you know, Marlon lets Robin know that he's now into detailing cars, not stealing them. And he has his own detailing business now. So he gives her his business cards and tells her if, you know, if she ever needs a wash and wax that he got her, you know. So Robin goes back over to the table and picks up the credit card folder, you know, that little thing they put the credit card in and to pay the bill. And when she opens it, honey there she sees a message inside written on a napkin that says 8 809 poverty road you'll find the truth there and robin looks around the restaurant quickly and then runs outside to see who may have written that message so she contacts harry to see if he can locate that um cameras in the area so harry um locates that address though he don't see many cameras but he locates the address and gives robin info about that property Mel is telling Robin that it may be a, a trap because someone is luring her to an abandoned farmhouse in Staten Island and that she shouldn't go there alone. Robin agrees and says she'll hold off and hangs up. Meanwhile, Mel and Harry, they're like, she's going there by herself. So as Robin goes into that place looking around, Mel shows up and starts startles Robin. Then Robin walks over and pulls the dusty cover off an automobile and she immediately recognizes it as her father's car. She said it was the one he was killed in almost 30 years ago. So my question is, if her dad was killed in that car, 
why didn't the family or the police get possession of the vehicle? You know, I was like, that line didn't make sense to me. So now the police are on the scene and dusting for fingerprints. Robin learns that back when her father was killed, that property belonged to someone named Julius McElroy, who is now deceased. Well, Robin must have heard me asking that question, y'all, because she said her father was carjacked and his body was left in the street and she was only 17 years old at that time. So she shares with Mel why her father was out that night to get her. So we learned why Robin blamed herself for this de his death. Then we see Robin sit inside of the car and finds a cassette tape in the glove compartment. Y'all remember cassette tapes? Oh, shoot. And she starts reminiscing about her time spent with her father, you know, in that car. And I love the songs that was playing in the background. Especially that Lovely Day by Bill Withers. Lovely day, lovely day, lovely day, lovely day. And in the restaurant, they even were playing, what was that? Just the two of us. And that was by um, what, Grover Washington Jr., but Bill Withers sang on that. And I said, what are we doing, a Bill Withers stuff now? And then um, then they also played, um, what's that one by Bobby Caldwell? What you won't do, do for love. You'll find anything, but you won't give. I like that song. Anyway, let me go on. So when Robin snaps out of her daydream, you know, Aunt Vi shows up and is shaking a bit, you know, and Mel hugs her and then shows Robin a name tag with the name Dolly on it. Vi recalls an old neighbor they had um, back when... Um, she had a daughter named Mary or something who used to go by the name Dolly. So Robin reaches out to Harry who informs her that Mary Houston, hashtag Dolly, lives in the Bronx with her two daughters now. So they learned that the name tag came from a job that she had back then. And it lets Robin believe that she was in the car when her father was killed. So Robin asked Harry for Mary's address. Meanwhile, Back at the precinct, Detective Dante's captain asked to speak with him in her office. She lets him know that um, Internal Affairs recovered his stolen service weapon from Lolo's hangout. What is it? Lonnie Lofton's? His hangout and that it hasn't been fired. Then we learn that Lolo is in the hospital in a medically induced coma. And I want to know, how in the world is that fool still alive? Somebody put it in the comment section. How that boy still alive? He had to fall like at least five flights. Anyways, she wanted to know why he was chasing Lolo after she specifically told him to stay away. And then she lets Dante know that the next time she gives him a direct order and he better follow it and or it will be the last time or the last order or something he gets. And Dante said, understood. Mm, mm, mm. Now we see Robin at Mary's house and Mary tells why she had been in Robin's father's car. And after hearing her story, Robin feels that those guys may have been behind her father's murder. So after some digging with the receipts from, you know, the restaurant, uh, that brass spoon, Harry came up with a guy named Demetrius Young, whose great, great uncle was the owner of that farmhouse in Staten Island. I said, uh oh, we getting close now. So Robin realized now that her father was targeted and that it wasn't a random shooting. But Harry and Mel do not think this guy killed Robin's father because why would he slip her the note? And I was saying the same thing. So Robin wants to go to this guy's home and Mel and Harry are trying to stop her from doing something she will regret. She says she don't care. This guy will have to help her connect the dots and then she told Mel not to follow her that this was something she had to do alone so she gets to Demetrius his name Demetrius she gets to Demetrius home and Robin is in his apartment as he opens the door she's pointing a gun at him then she zaps him with a stun gun and he falls to the floor then he when he wakes up he's cuffed to a radiator with those plastic wrist ties or wrist cuffs whatever they call them and Robin asks him some questions and he tells her what's happened in his life and why he left her that note he also told her that he um converted over to Islam you know, while in prison and changed his name to Abdul Muhammad and then decided to do good in um, the community when he got out. You know, I said, OK, that's nice. But what I don't understand is how did he know who Robin was since he has been in jail and had not even seen her that we know of to our knowledge? He had never seen her before. He acknowledged that, you know, what was done to her father and then said, you know, they were supposed to only scare him. 
and he would not tell who shot her father because she said we you know she was like like who else was it who pulled the trigger and he said he did it but he was lying so he wouldn't tell her who shot her father instead said it might as well have been him because he didn't stop the guy from doing it and robin leaves the apartment promising demetrius abdul whatever i'm gonna call them both that she would find out who did it and then come back to deal with him and he dropped some profound knowledge on her stating revenge and retaliation are corrosive to the soul they never bring you peace and robin said i ain't seeking peace and she walked out i said girl you too much girl then back at the back cave you know that's what i like to call harry in them spot you know we have harry and mel and robin looking at demetrius background and seeing that he was telling her the truth about changing his life then dante calls to inform uh, robin that the police found the fingerprints of yancey turner in her father's car he's the head of the biggest crime syndicate in brooklyn and so Robin wants to go after him, even though her team, including Dante, are stating that he is untouchable. Mm -hmm. Not for Robin, he ain't. So they see them, uh, that most of the crew has done hard time, but never Yancey. Then Robin sees a pic of Mark hanging with that old crew. And, uh, you know, that old friend that she ran into in the brass spoon. So, of course, she goes to confront him by waiting in the back seat of his car. When he gets into the car, Robin puts a gun to the back of his head and questions him. He says he had nothing to do with the car, Jack, and told her that it was because of her father that he even stopped stealing and stopped hanging with those guys and had no more illegal dealings with them. And she said illegal. He then tells her that Yancey and his crew got a lot of cars and that he details them. So, of course, Robin gets an idea and asks Mark to help her get into Yancey's spot. So he drives up and tells the guys he's there to um detail Yancey's bins and they let him through. When he parks the car, Robin gets out and goes upstairs to Yancey's office. And when he comes, Yancey comes into the um, office, she catches him off guard because he's on the phone talking and she punches him in the face, knocking him to the floor and kicking him several times in the side as he's asking, how did you get in here? How did you get in here? He sounded like a little wussy. I ain't gonna lie, y'all. He sounded like a little wussy, you know? So... After kicking him several times, you know, and him saying that, then Robin pulled out her gun and refreshed Yancey's memory for him. Then she told him that she just wanted to see his face before she repaid the favor. And she had the gun about three inches from Yancey's eyes when Dante came in and said, don't. And, and I'm like, what? And she tells him to leave so he doesn't have to witness this, she put it. And he tells her, don't do it and throw her life away for this trash. And Robin says, he has to pay. And Dante says, he will by spending his life in prison. Killing him will be mercy. Let the system do what it is designed to do. Let's not hear it. Hear, let me say that again. Let the system do what it is designed to do. Oh, child. And then he tells her that her family needs her. He said, I need you. I said, oh, honey, I nearly passed out. He said, I need you. I was like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. But Robin then took that gun and pressed it right into Yancey's face and he is definitely a little punk because you could see he was so so scared and couldn't even fight her you know and then she backed off and swung one more time whop hitting him to the, in the face with her gun and knocking him down on the floor and Dante looked at her like damn <laughs> you know so Dante said they can hold Yancey for 24 hours and that he heard there's a witness and that it she wants to, you know, this the stick she needs to make him come forward. Now, my question is, how did Dante know where to find Robin and how did he get inside? Somebody please put that down in the comment section because I surely, surely don't get it. So Robin goes back to Demetrius Abdul's apartment, gets him to testify. He asked her, did she get the revenge she was seeking? And she said, someone talked her out of it. She said, oh, good, good for him or something like that. She said, no, lucky for you or something like that. So anyway, he, he agreed to testify, even though he knew Yancey's people would kill him. And Robin told him he was going back to prison anyways. And that the only question is, will his last act be one of courage or one of cowardice? Which I was like, oh, okay, 
Anyway, so Robin gets back, you know, home and she sees Dee and Vi on the couch looking at pics of Dee's grandfather and Vi's brother. And Robin informs them that she got a witness to testify against the person who murdered her father. She said it looks like they're finally going to get justice, you know, for daddy. And they all hug. Now, I got to tell y'all that I'm loving all of these moments in this show where we are seeing some black family love and all the hugging and stuff and saying, I love you. This is really, this, this, this works for my spirit. Cause you never see this in a lot of these black shows. You don't see it. And I thank you, Queen Latifah and your, your partners, whoever putting this show together for doing that. Now at this moment, Dante calls Robin with some bad news and it seems Yancey's high priced lawyers and the powerful people that he's in bed with DA Grafton was confident that she couldn't make the murder charge stick by the word of Demetrius, who is still seen as a con convicted felon. And Robin is pissed and going off on Marcus about it because she showed up at that courthouse sure enough and went in on him. And she lets him know again that the system is broken and it failed her as it did so many of her clients in the past. She told him, I tried to get justice your way and now I'm going to do it my way. And he told her that her way is not justice, it's murder. And she, he tries to talk her out of whatever it is she's planning. And he said, I know you're angry, but, and she said, she cuts him off in the mid sentence and said, angry doesn't begin to describe what I am feeling right now. So then, what Dante is forgetting is how he was feeling for a drug dealer who only injured his friend, put him in the hospital, but he only injured him. And he went after that man, ignoring his captain's orders. So he should truly understand Robin's feelings in this matter, you know, about a drug dealer who murdered her blood, her father. You know what I mean? Anyway, so as Robin is driving, she once again reminisces about her father and some advice he had given her back when she was 17, when he told her some things are worth fighting for. So she gets home and grabs a few weapons from her wall safe and Aunt Vi goes into her room, okay, and tries to talk some sense into her and letting her know that she can't change the past and this won't bring him back. And Robin says, this man took everything from us and I was too young to do something about it and I'll be damned if I don't do something now. And Aunt Vi said, you know, but at what cost? Losing you too? I said, talk to her, Vi. Talk to her. So Vi says to Robin, I know I can't stop you, girl. Once you made up your mind, she held her face in her hand and said, just make sure, baby, you come back to us. And Robin just leaves out without answering. And now we see Robin showing up at Yancey's spot again by herself. And he thinks, you know, she's dumb for showing up again as I do too, y'all. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm like, what is she thinking? So she tells him to cough up his confession and, you know, he laughs at her. So now she, um, she's surrounded, you know, by at least 25 of Yancey's men, you know, they have uh, taken away all of her weapons. So Robin starts talking about him, um, supposed to be so tough, but he needs all these men, but reminds him that he is still the same scared ass punk from way back then. So then Robin asked him, why did he do it? And Yancey said, your father stuck his nose where it didn't belong. So I gave him what he had coming. And he tells her what happened and told her he pulled the trigger back then and that he was going to do it again and keep it a family tradition. And Robin tells him, I just needed to be sure. Then she tells him, because she said, oh, you pulled the trigger. Then she tells Harry to do it. And he sends uh, info to members of Yancey's crew. I don't know how he gets all those people's uh, cell phone numbers and everything. But as Robin starts to blow up Yancey's spot by telling his crew to check their phones and that they may find some educational info, such as why they all did time and Yancey didn't and how he was messing with another one's wife while he was in prison, etc. And she told them to take a look and find out all of the different ways, personal, financial, legal, and other ways, their boss screwed them over. She kept saying, look. And yes, he starts pointing his guns at his crew saying, it's all fake, and telling them to back up and back up. And they closed in on him and started beating his behind. I tell you, and one of the guys gave Robin both of her guns back. And she leaves saying, Handle your business and don't worry because we're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> 
So now Robin goes back to see Demetrius Abdul and she tells him that Yancey is gone and that she is not taking him in and what he did to her father, she could never forgive. She wants him to help others find their path the way that he found his. And that makes him too valuable to lock away. And he said, I won't let you down. And Robin said, I know you won't because if you do, I will have my vengeance. I said, oh, girl, still got the vengeance thing going on. So then we have Detective Dante in his captain's office and learning that Lonnie Lofton, Lolo, y'all know, has regained consciousness and is accusing Detective Dante of pushing him off that roof. I said, I did not tell y'all in my episode. I said, it's going to come back looking like Dante pushed that boy off the ep- off the roof. I knew it. I knew it. So Dante is surprised and said he is sticking by his report. So she reminds him of the scrutiny the department is under. And she tells him that until this is sorted out, he is suspended for as long as the investigation takes. Then she tells him to go home and let the system take its course. And he stares at her and says, the system? I said, see how things go? That is what the line that he used on Robin. Wow. And Robin didn't want to hear that mess either. So now it's morning and Aunt Vi sits down next to Robin and thanks her for bringing her closure around her brother's death. Robin says, you know, you're welcome and that she did it for all of them. And Aunt Vi says she hopes this brings Robin some peace after all these years, her blaming herself for her father's death. She tells her now, you see that those boys had it out for your father. And if it didn't happen that night, it would have been another time. Then Robin tells Aunt Vi she loves her. And Aunt Vi says, you're going to love me even more in about 30 seconds because I I have a little surprise for you out in the garage. And so Robin goes out there and it was her father's car. Robin placed her hand on the driver's side window and could hear her father's favorite song playing. Fly, Robin, fly. Fly, Robin, fly. Up, up in the sky. Remember by that group, what was it? Silver Convention. That was the name of the group. That's a boy. I know I hadn't heard from them in a long time anyway. And she hears her father's voice saying, thank you. And she starts crying and says, I miss you, daddy. And then she wipes her tears away when she hears D and Aunt Vi come into the garage and they all are standing there side by side. The lighter says, that's grandpa's car. And they say, yeah. And she said, it's beautiful. And Robin says, it's home. And once again, they all start hugging and that's how it went off. And I'm sorry this review was so long, but y'all, I had to give y'all the details because this episode was touching to me. It was a beautiful episode. I can't wait to hear what everybody else got to say down in the comment section. Put your your thoughts and feelings about the episode there. Um, Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Please don't forget to subscribe. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.